Hello everybody. Today we shall be discussing on another unusual presentation of microbial keratitis in our series of lectures on different aspects of microbial keratitis that we had uh, presented earlier. I am Aravind Roy. I am uh, your host for this session and I am a cornea and anterior segment faculty at L.V. Prasad Eye Institute at India. Before we begin, could you please cite your position? So we have a fair mix of all eye care workers as well as surgeons in training in the audience. Thank you very much. Microbial keratitis is a leading cause of corneal blindness and it is a significant cause of ocular morbidity, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia. If we look at the incidence of reports that have been published, one can very easily note out that the incidence of new cases of microbial keratitis is almost 10 times more in the developing nations as compared to the developed nations. In a report that was published from Southern India, the projections were that in India alone, there are 840,000 new cases of corneal ulcers that occur annually. Based on this, we need to understand that microbial keratitis continues to be one of the leading ocular emergencies. In the recent paper that was published from our institute during the ocular responses and the emergencies that were encountered during the COVID-19 pandemic, microbial keratitis and trauma were the leading two causes of ocular emergencies that needed immediate attention of the ophthalmologist. Microbial keratitis needs a lot of support from the diagnostics, including microbiology. Access to a good microbiology laboratory service is essential. Culture has and continues to remain the gold standard for diagnosis of microbial keratitis. How do we consider a growth to be significant? Growth is significant if the same organism grows in two solid media, one solid media or turbidity in liquid media. Confluent growth in one solid media that is consistent with microscopy or there is growth of the organism on repeat scraping, the same organisms. A host of uh, media are required and a typical workflow of a scraping material goes through three smears which are the 10% KOH, calcofloor white wet mount, gram stain and ginsa stain. So not only that, but there are also several other solid and liquid media and slants that one needs to take into consideration for inoculating the material. This includes typically the sheep blood agar with 5% sheep blood agar, one plate into aerobic and another into anaerobic incubation, chocolate agar with 5% carbon dioxide, slants for fungal growth, for what, which include potato dextrose agar and saburo dextrose agar and liquid media, hyaluglycolate broth, and brain heart infusion broth. Based on an analysis of 3,563 corneal scrapings, the smears were compared to the gold standard, which is the culture positivity. And gram, KOH, and GIMSA were compared for sensitivity and specificity to bacteria, fungi, and parasites. The sensitivity of bacteria was pretty low. The specificity was very high. What does it mean? It means that if one gets the organism in the smear, then one can be sure that you are dealing with a particular type of bacteria. It could be rods or cocci likewise. But if you do not get it, that means the sensitivity is low, then one cannot be sure that whether we are dealing with a bacteria or not. But that is not the case for fungi and parasites because the sensitivity and specificity is pretty much higher. And it is even higher if we compare the specificity and sensitivity for the KOH calcofloor wet mount. So if we see the fungus alone, the, the calcofloor white positivity shows 94% specificity and 90% sensitivity. What it means is that if we do get fungus, then we can be pretty sure that we are dealing with a case of fungal keratitis. And likewise, if we get acanthamoeba cysts, we can be pretty sure that we are dealing with acanthamoeba 
and we can start the antiparasite drugs. Now, why is it important? Because fungi and parasites can have chronic infection and often they need specific treatment for longer durations of time. Therefore, one should not blindly start antifungal or antiparasitic without a definitive evidence. And the most simplest and definitive evidence is a 10% KOH wet mount, which can be put up in any simple uh, place and, and, and it can be a very good uh, accessory to a cornea service. So based on this, the treatment paradigms are that because most incident studies on microbial keratitis have found that bacteria are the commonest cause of keratitis, one should start with the empirical broad spectrum treatment. When I mean empirical broad spectrum treatment, we mean that we should start with an antibiotic which has a wide range of coverage against gram positive and gram negative organisms. This includes fortified organisms, fortified antibiotics, which could be ciprofloxacin, vancomycin, aminoglycosides, or a combination of these. The most typical combination that we use is fortified cefazolin or fortified vancomycin with ciprofloxacin, which gives us a wide coverage for gram positive and gram negative organisms. And when we encounter fungi or acanthamoeba, then we start the treatment with 5% natamycin or we start with chlorhexidine or polyhexamethyl biguanide in case of acanthamoeba. In addition to microbiology, Confocal microscopy is a big aid to the corneal diagnostics. The confocal is based on the principle of a common focal point of the observer and the illumination arc. Most of the illumination that or the magnification that can be noted in ophthalmic diagnostic systems is limited to about 40x, meaning that if we enlarge the images, then we'll just end up with big and blurry images. Whereas the confocal by adjusting the focal lens can increase the axial illumination and the magnification in such a manner that the resolution can be up to one to two microns. The normal slit lamp gives you a resolution up to a maximum of 20 microns. Whereas the confocal can give up to one to two microns axially and laterally it gives a resolution of up to five to 10 microns. That gives us the advantage of detecting in vivo, in the cornea, fungi, parasites, and other pathologies. But before we understand pathology, it's very important to understand the normal corneal physiology. The anterior stoma typically has elongated nuclei. There are activated keratocytes, nerve fibers. The posterior stroma is comparatively less cellular. And the endothelium, presents as a monolayer of hexagonal or polygonal cells. The maximum intensity is in the cell body. The margins are dark, well-defined, and the nuclei are usually not seen. Subepithelial plexuses can be below the Bowman's or they can be above the Bowman's. And they are typically consisting of wavy, beaded, branched nerve fibers in the diameter of three to seven microns. The stromal nerves appear to pierce through the stroma. They are linear. They have V or Y shaped branching. They are usually much thicker in the range of 10 to 15 microns. Fungi can present as irregular branched reflective double wall filaments. They have an irregular branching and they are typically in bunches. So this is the characteristic picture of a fungal filament in the corneal stroma. The bacterial keratitis is characterized by plenty of activated keratocytes and infiltration with leukocytes and Langerhans cells. Bacteria typically are not visualized. Fungal keratitis has filaments and viral keratitis is characterized by ovoid dendritic cells at the level of the subepithelial layer. These are typically not visualized in the slit lamp. Acanthamoeba presents as highly reflective double wall round particles. They have a diameter of 10 to 20 microns. The inner wall typically has an hexagonal configuration. These are pointers that perhaps we are dealing with acanthamoeba cysts 
and not just something which is an artifact. So with this, let's come to the question that what would be true for confocal except? Okay, so as we discussed that tandem and slit scanning techniques may be used to image. So that's true for confocal. They are usually useful for atypical keratinase because in case of atypical organisms such as fungi or acanthamoeba, often it's not possible to get a biopsy. And in these cases, in real time, the confocal helps in imaging. And if the confocal is positive, then one can be reasonably sure that we are dealing with these atypical or unusual organisms. Bacteria could not be visualized. And in addition to all of this, the confocal is usually helpful to get the pachymetry as well as to measure the endothelial cell density. Therefore, the confocal can certainly help you get a measure of the pachy and the cell density. In a publication from our group, we found that when we compared confocal microscopy in the setting of fungal keratitis and acanthamoeba keratitis and compared it with the gold standard, that is culture positivity, we found that the sensitivity and the specificity of this method of diagnosing keratitis was 88.3 and 91.1%. And the inter-observer agreement was very good with a kappa of 0.6. So when we looked at the way microbial keratitis is treated everywhere, we found that in spite of very definitive signs of a suppurative keratitis, the microbiology would be negative. And this is true in 50% cases in Ghana and 31% cases in India in a comparative study between these two places. Why was that? It was perhaps because that in such scenarios, the amount of scraping that can be taken can be limited. The viability of the organisms may be questionable or the organism may get inactivated when they are transported to the laboratory. So it is a reality for the cornea surgeon that in almost half of your microbial keratitis, even if there are very, very clear cut signs of an active infectious process, the microbiology is going to be negative. What should one do in such a, con in, in such a consideration? How, how are we going to approach the patient? How are we going to treat in such a scenario? To aid our treatment, to help in prognostication, a scoring system was also proposed by these authors. This was true for fungal keratitis. And they also issued a caveat that perhaps one should use the scoring system in those areas or those regions of the world where fungal keratitis is common. So they found that the odds ratio for say certain typical features of fungal keratitis, such as serrated ill-defined margins, erased slough, a dry texture of the slough or a color which is not typically yellow, but a typical color of the infiltrate can have a higher odds of the keratitis, presumably being of fungal etiology. And this, they also very specifically mentioned in the paper, would be true for those regions of the world where fungal keratitis is common. And that would be Southeast Asia, India, Africa, South Florida. But it may not be true in temperate climate, such as the United Kingdom. So with this background, that there can be a lot of variability between the patients who have a clear cut feature of microbial keratitis vis-a-vis -a, -vis a diagnosis which is elusive, the microbiology being consistently negative. We can often end up with number of co-infections, super infections, unusual presentations. And in the rest of the talk, we shall be highlighting these with certain examples and certain learning objectives that we gain from each of these scenarios. We'll take a few questions at the end of the session, but I will, you, I will just take you through the patterns in which microbial keratitis can present in very confusing manners. <laughs>
So we'll start with our first patient who was a 51-year-old female who presented with a history of graft infiltrate. The patient had undergone failed, uh, had undergone therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty for a fungal keratitis which was performed two years ago. The graft had eventually failed. The scrapings showed Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the graft uh, resolved, the graft infiltrate, I'm sorry, resolved with topical antibiotics. She was administered ciprofloxacin hourly for two weeks. However, the graft surface had a scar, two quadrants of vascularization and had a generally poor surface. This was the background for the subsequent infection, which was very interesting. She presented after one year. She was maintained on topical lubricants and a low potency topical corticosteroid. She presented with a five days history of irritation in her right eye. There was a small area of opacity. So what are the features that alerted us that this could perhaps be infection? Number one, there was some mild irritation, non-specific history and a poor surface. It's stained with fluorescein, so that's why the color is slightly greenish. Overall, there look to be some areas of serrated margins. Are we dealing with fungus here? We, we are not sure. There are some satellites. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, corneal sutures had some amount of infiltrates around them or cellularity, which was indicative of possibly an inflammatory component in the anterior segment. Nevertheless, we started her off on broad spectrum antibiotics after taking the samples from the cornea. And we also stopped the topical corticosteroids. The scraping yielded yeast. The culture was candida albicans. So she was shifted to topical fluconazole eight times a day for three weeks. Okay, so there are some questions from the participants, but uh, let us take the questions once we finish the cases. So then this was the clinical course of the patient. She gradually increased, the infiltrates increased in size, intensity and dimensions. And then over a period of three weeks with topical fluconazole alone, there was gradual improvement ultimately leading to a scar in the graft. Our understanding of candida keratitis comes from this paper by Sanetta. Candida species are typically opportunists that can occasionally complicate a chronic keratopathy, including corneal grafts. Usually, there is a background of immunosuppression or diabetes that may predispose to candidiasis. They can be misdiagnosed and in fact, in fact, if they do not respond to medical treatment, they may require a penetrating keratoplasty. The demographics of this study found in this paper found that most of the patients had an ocular surface disorder, a chronic keratopathy or a toxicity. Usually there was a background of pre-treatment with corticosteroids or antibacterial agents. They were often misdiagnosed as bacterial keratitis. And Candida albicans was the most commonly isolated organism. This is another very interesting scenario. I'm sure all of us would have seen this in the cornea clinic. Peripheral ulcerative keratitis is another corneal emergency. There is a progressive crescentic shaped ulceration of the peripheral cornea. It could be due to several causes, which can be broadly categorized into non-infectious and infectious. The infectious causes could be viral, bacterial, fungal. In fact, there are myriad causes that might cause a peripheral crescentic lesion. And when there is an immune-mediated peripheral ulcerative keratitis. Even those can be secondarily contaminated by microorganisms, including the patient's own microflora. The typical features are 
a infiltrate with signs of inflammation as can be very obvious in this picture but sometimes it's not so obvious in a 66 year old male who was a laborer presented with a 10 day history of trauma following which there was pain and redness the clinical picture was that of a peripheral ulcerative keratitis there were some areas of cellularity and some areas of thinning of the cornea because there was a clear cut history of injury we withheld the steroids and gave the patient a empirical broad spectrum antibiotic regimen the patient did not improve but he did not worsen either and the infiltrates continued to remain as such they were very minimal and not really amenable to scraping in view of the progressive crescentic thinning of the peripheral cornea he was advised a conjunctival resection with tissue adhesives and bandage contact lens application and then usually in these cases we prescribe a topical corticosteroid which is usually 1% prednisolone acetate and when the patient presented after one month this was the clinical picture there was obviously a super infection here and there was a florid infection with a lot of corneal melt involving the entire inferior cornea there was dense hypopia and this kind of a melt is usually typical of a very aggressive organism and in these cases usually we suspect that it could be either pseudomonas or any other gram negative bacteria and true to our suspicions the scrapings indeed yielded gnb and the culture was pseudomonas pure and significant growth this was fortunately not a multi drug resistant pseudomonas but pseudomonas that was very sensitive to almost all the antibiotics so the patient was continued with ciprofloxacin steroids were stopped and the patient eventually resolved with scarring often peripheral ulcerative keratitis can have a scleral component as well and it's important to make the distinction between infectious and non-infectious etiology the pointers towards an infectious etiology is first pointing involvement of adjacent areas sometimes there might be satellite nodular like lesions cellularity infiltrates and anterior chamber reaction including hypopia all of this point that we are perhaps dealing with infection and not purely a immune mediated lesion of the cornea anterior segment or the adjacent sclera with this we go to our next case scenario which is a 44 year old agricultural worker who presented with a history of a fall of foreign body with watering and pain since the last 10 days he was prescribed topical moxifloxacin and ciprofloxacin eye ointment at bed time when we examined the lesion it appeared as a raised dry appearing slough with ill defined margins there were some areas of pigmentation over the corneal ulcer the peripheral cornea had a lot of corneal edema and desmes membrane fold and there was a 1 to 1.5 mm of hypopion in the anterior chamber the scraping yielded septate hyaline filamentous fungus but the culture yielded presence of two fungi and one of which was dimaceous fungus so if we look at the clinical picture there is the faint pigmentation that is there pigments in the setting of a dry rough appearing infiltrate which was suggestive of a fungal keratitis are a pointer towards dimaceous fungus dimaceous fungus cause macroscopic pigmentation of the ulcers and usually they need to be treated aggressively the first line of treatment is natamycin the patient was eventually lost to follow up but when he presented back almost after a year during the lockdown last year he had healed well and the cornea was scarred so what is true in the management of dimaceous fungus so usually moriconazole is not the first line of treatment 
the first line of treatment is natamycin but it's true that while they respond well to management they may need surgical management and there is a poor visual prognosis in case they do not respond as you can see in this picture this is the clinical picture of a dimaceous fungus where there is almost a florid microscopic pigmentation this doesn't belong to the previous patient but this belongs to another patient and i have put it for representative purposes that this is how the ulcers appear it appears as if there is a perforation in the cornea with entire uveal prolapse or there is a lot of uveal pigments on the surface but actually this is just a plaque and it is heavily pigmented because of the dimaceous fungi so our experience has been published both from south and north india and our paper on uh, keratomycosis was published earlier in 2000 Uh, in the journal of ophthalmology sengupta et al have also published their experience from south india in a recent paper in 2011 and they have compared our study as well as two studies from western literature all in all in summary these papers found that carbon area is the commonest dimaceous fungus the study by sengupta et al showed that they were dealing with much severe ulcers the average size of which was 10.5 square millimeters therefore the presenting visual acuity was less than 2400 in 80% of patients the macroscopic pigmentation was found in 14% in their study whereas in our study from lvpi we found that in 27% of patients the final visual acuity was not studied in our series but it was better than 2040 in all the western studies in that range from 44 to 78% however it was lower in the sengupta et al study probably because they were dealing with more severe mycosis 48% of their ulcers healed as compared to 81 and 72% in the other studies penetrating keratoplasty was required in 15% in our series and 8.6% in the same group of study evisceration was required in 9 to 11% so all in all natamycin is the first line of treatment and carbolaria is the common species it does present with macroscopic pigmentation it responds well but in 10% of cases it may require a penetrating keratoplasty superficial keratectomy or even evisceration our next case is that of a 66 year old homemaker who presented with a five day history of watering pain and redness in her left eye the clinical picture was typical of a fungal keratitis there were ill defined margins there were satellite lesions dry texture of the slough and she was responding well with 5% natamycin which is the first line of treatment there was peripheral scarring and the area of infiltrates were constantly reducing in size and intensity after 6 weeks of treatment she presented with this clinical picture she was very symptomatic to start with there was increase in the infiltrates there was melting and sudden increase in hypopia so when this happens in the setting of fungal keratitis always think of a possible super infection likewise she was scraped again and we found that in addition to the septate hyaline filamentous fungi we also had gram positive cocci in pairs the culture yielded aspergillus flavus and streptococcus pyogenes and this was the sensitivity profile of the organism she was placed on topical ciprofloxacin and after 2 months of treatment with both antifungals and antibiotics she, she resolved with scarring and vascularization the learning here is that bacterial co-infection can occur in fungal keratitis in 5 to 25% of cases gram positive cocci are usually equally associated with either yeast or filamentous fungus gram negative rods have a propensity to 
affect yeast or candida keratitis. Gram positive rods are usually associated with filamentous fungi and gram negative with yeasts. This happens because yeasts have a biofilm and the biofilm attracts the bacteria. Sometimes this is a mutual synergistic mechanism where each organism helps the other to grow and create a super infection. Sometimes the patient's own microflora can co-infect a healing or resolving fungal keratitis. All these scenarios exist. The demographics of the such kind of keratitis is very similar. That means that fungal keratitis without co-infection and those with bacterial co-infections are usually very similar to start with. But we really, really do not know what are the factors that are responsible for certain patients having a bacterial co-infection. But what we do know is that if they are gram-positive cocci, then there is a fair chance that it could either be a yeast infection or it could also be a filamentous fungal infection. Whereas gram-positive rods are usually more commonly associated with filamentous fungi and gram-negative rods are more commonly associated with candida. The typical clinical features that the clinician would expect is a sudden worsening after improvement of fungal keratitis. With this background, let's have this question about what are true of bacterial co-infection in fungal keratitis. So the correct answer is C. The demographics are very similar irrespective of whether there is a co-infection or not in the background of bacterial fungal keratitis. Because co-infections co do occur, and that's true. There is increased severity of the keratitis because of a co-infection, that's true. It occurs because of adherence of the bacteria to the fungal biofilm, that's also true. But the demographics are not different. The demographics are exactly the same, irrespective of whether the co-infection occurs or not. The demographics are very similar irrespective of whether it's just a fungal infection or a fungal infection with a bacterial co-infection. Our next case is a very interesting case of a farmer who presented with a five month history of watering, pain and redness in his left eye. To begin with, there was some areas of scarring of the cornea. And if we look at the superficial cornea, there is just scarring with pigmentation in the inferonasal paracentral peripheral cornea. Whereas the 12 o'clock cornea had some very interesting lesions, which were deep, mid to deep stromal corneal infiltrates and some keratic precipitates with endothelial plaques. This typically had a history of waxing and waning. And likewise, we made a provisional diagnosis of HSV immune stromal keratitis. This is so because HSV immune stromal keratitis is primarily a clinical diagnosis. There is typically a history of waxing and waning. There is a long duration of treatment and the corneal sensations could be impaired. In addition, this patient also had some areas of peripheral scarring and also vascularization. All this fit into the clinical picture of HSV immune stromal keratitis. So when the patient was started with topical corticosteroids and oral acyclovir 400 milligram five times a day, the patient started worsening. When there is worsening in such cases, immediately think of two possibilities. Number one, are we dealing with acanthamoeba or are we dealing with fungus over here? So the patient was taken up for a corneal biopsy. This was so because the lesions were in the mid stroma of the cornea. And we noted fungal filaments and high copy numbers of HSC1 DNA by a quantitative PCR. This is how a corneal biopsy should be taken. Usually corneal biopsy is performed for mid to deep stromal lesions. The lesions should be in the peripheral cornea because this process can lead to scarring and therefore it, it, this process is not possible in lesions that are in the central cornea. After raising a flap from the deeper corneal tissue, we scraped some material 
and also took one small amount of corneal stroma and subjected it to histopathology and microbiology. The superficial flap is sutured back with interrupted tenno nylon sutures. The microbiology in GMS stain and in gram stain yielded septate filamentous fungus. We had also taken some anterior chamber exudates and subjected it to quantitative PCR because for HSV1 DNA, because we had strongly suspected from clinical science that this was a case of HSV, immune stromal keratitis, and we got high copy numbers of HSV1 DNA. The high copy numbers of HSV1 DNA was suggestive that we are dealing with a active replication of HSV. So this patient was unusual because it had infection with HSV as well as fungus. The patient continued to worsen and was taken up for a therapeutic penetrating keratoplast. We understand from this review that nearly 100% of individuals above the age of 60 and most middle-aged persons harbor HSV in the trigeminal ganglia. Conventional PCR and immunohistochemistry are both sensitive for the detection of HSV1, but a combination, meaning that if there is a positivity on conventional PCR and immunohistochemistry, the specificity of diagnosis of herpes simplex keratitis increases to 97%. We also recently published a paper where we found that conventional, compared to conventional PCR, Real-time PCR is a much more faster, sensitive, and specific method of detecting HSV1 DNA. Quantitative PCR not only determines the presence of the copy numbers, but it also provides us the exact viral load. And it distinguishes that whether there is an infection with HSV1 or HSV2. Therefore, it helps in assessing the response to treatment. Patients who have high viral loads, meaning larger amounts of copy numbers, suggest that the disease is increasing in severity and probably it may have a poorer prognosis. Dual infection with HSV1 and 2 have also been described. And the kind of virus which has the lower copy number is usually copied out. Co-infection can occur as we saw in this case with either fungi or bacteria. And when such a scenario occurs, then one needs to treat for them in addition to treatment for the HSV. Our next case is that of a 38 year old homemaker. She presented with 10 day history of watering, pain and redness. There was a dry appearing raised slough in the central cornea. There was a peripheral guttering. There were ill-defined margins. No obvious satellites, but it certainly had dot-like infiltrates around the entire central lesion. This picture is very characteristic and should alert the surgeon about a possible pythium insidiosum keratitis. The smear and culture yielded pythium. Pythium is often confused with fungal keratitis. This is because they have septate filamentous bands which are seen in the calcofloor white KOH wet mounts as seen in this figure. However, they are very scantily septate or usually aseptate. They have ribbon-like folds and often they have 90 degree branchings. So a flat ribbon-like scantily septate, aseptate filaments with 90 degree branchings should alert the physician about a possible pythium infection. It grows in chocolate agar as flat, glabrous or oily, colorless colonies. The definitive diagnosis for pythium is by demonstrating zoospore formation or by DNA analysis by PCR you, using genes which are for the internal transcriber region of the ribosomal DNA. 
So the patient was started with linezolid and azithromycin. The patient continued to worsen on this treatment and ultimately she had a large central corneal perforation. The patient was taken up for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty. Keratoplasty is very challenging in the scenario of Pythium insidiosum keratitis. This is because there is a very high incidence of recurrence of Pythium after keratoplasty, which is because the lesions can actually extend much farther into the peripheral cornea than what can be observed on the naked eye. What is recommended and with our experience, we have also known that one needs to take a large margin clearance of at least one millimeter all round so that we do not inadvertently include any tissue that might be infected with the infiltrates and thereby leading behind a area of infection, which may lead to recurrence post keratoplast. Fortunately, there was no recurrence because this was entirely a corneal lesion and we could take a very healthy margin of one millimeter on either side and she ended up with a clear graft that remained clear for six months until she had an episode of acute graft rejection, following which the graft failed. After six months, very recently, about two weeks earlier, we performed optical penetrating keratoplasty and cataract extraction with IOL implantation for this patient. After two weeks of the second transplant, the patient is doing well with 2080 vision. Our understanding of Pythium keratitis comes from the paper that was published earlier from our group. Typically, Pythium has tentacle dot-like, plaque-like presentations with a peripheral gutter. Scraping shows broad, sparsely septate filaments and glabrous flat colonies on chocolate agar. DNA sequencing to the internal transcriber region of ribosomal DNA and zoospore formation are confirmatory of Pythium. The response is better to antibacterials such as TG cycline, azithromycin, linezolid or macrolides. There is a consistent poor response to therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty and often the grafts fail or worse, they may have recurrence which may lead to evisceration or thysis. Our next case is that of a 55 year old farmer who presented with a three week history of watering, pain and redness. The scrapings were negative. As he was perforating, we performed a tissue adhesive and bandage contact lens. Some anterior chamber exudates were also taken and the patient was started on broad spectrum antibiotics. The AC exudates yielded septate fungal filaments but the real-time PCR also showed that there were 8,239 copy numbers of HSV1 DNA. This was a very rare scenario when there was co-infection with active HSV with fungus. Likewise, the patient was started with therapeutic doses of oral acyclovir, 400 milligram, five times a day for eight weeks and hourly natamycin. Eventually, over a two-month period, the infiltrates started resolving until the patient scarred. Once the scarring started and we were sure that there were no residual infiltrates, topical corticosteroids, which was 1% prednisolone acetate, was started in these cases. Fungal keratitis with HSV co-infection is very rare. Unless one has a very high index of suspicion, one is usually going to miss such cases. In advanced lesions, like in this case, clinical features might be quite undistinguishable. Quantitative PCR where available is confirmatory and combination therapy usually for long duration. By long, I mean at least eight weeks or more of treatment is required. There is a need for topical steroids to control the inflammation, but one should be very cautious in its use after ensuring that all the fungal infection has subsided or it will lead to explosive recurrence in such cases. Our last case for the evening is that of a 61 year old homemaker who presented with a five day history of watering pain and redness. She was a patient who was 
having a typical feature of fungal keratitis ill defined margins dry ray slough very uh, uh, very variegated appearance of a dry texture of these uh, lesions and we certainly were expecting fungus and we got that uh, in the 10% koh wet mop and she also resolved rapidly with 5% natamycin after one month of treatment she presented with a lot of pain and watering in, in her eyes when we inverted the lids the upper and lower tarsal conjunctiva was was like this there were a lot of papillary responses a lot of congestion and at the same time the patient was beautifully responding the the, the infiltrate was was uh, was just just about over there was there was just a bit faint scarring in the cornea what's happening here what's wrong clearly these are signs of drug toxicity meaning that the toxicity could be due to the preservative in the drugs or this could be due to the active drug molecule which was natamycin it could be due to the cyclopentolate or the atropine as well so the so it is important to understand that at this point of time there is no infection and we should stop the medications and a decision was made to stop all drugs and the patient was just maintained on lubricants and this was the clinical picture after 2 weeks of stopping all treatment and one can see the remarkable change in the upper and lower tarsal conjunctiva this was before and this was 2 weeks after of lubricants and one can see there is a dramatic change in the patient was very comfortable the initial corneal lesion had healed by now so all these are pointers that drug toxicity can also occur and they may confuse the picture of microbial keratitis therefore the learning from these cases is that when there are preservatives they may cause decrease in cell viability they cause increase in the cellular permeability with impaired wound healing they are affected by the dose duration concentration and the presence of preservatives in the drugs the topical drugs there was a very interesting paper that was published some time back by dua et al they specifically pointed out to what should be the clinical pointers that should alert the clinician about a possible drug toxicity the number one sign is that there is a clinical response of worsening after initial improvement that means that the drugs are working against the bugs but the moment the preservatives or the frequency of the drug increases there is a increase in symptomatology of the patient there is mild to intense pernicial congestion and if we compare the upper and the lower half of the bulbar conjunctiva there is intense redness in the inferior conjunctiva because all the drugs are gravitating to the inferior conjunctival fornix and if one inverts the lids one can see a florid papillary response in the tarsal conjunctiva as was seen in our case so with this we'll come to the last question of the session what are the factors that are responsible for ocular toxicity that's correct so allergy is not a factor it could be because of the concentration duration or frequency but not allergy so with this we end the discussion and we'll take a few questions and and then we'll take up any other interesting experiences that you may want to share with us so we'll take the questions as they keep coming our first question was by dr shake uh, who asked us that should we patch the eye during microbial infection no we should not uh, patch the eye at all we should keep it open perhaps we can advise dark glasses as the patients are usually photophobic the second question is that if microbial keratitis leads to neovascularization how do we treat it usually microbial keratitis the neovascularization resolves once the ulcer heals with scarring and host vessels are left behind but there are newer modalities of treatment as well which include microcautery as well as injection of anti vegf to the cornea so they have been tried by different groups with varied success is lactophenol blue stain better than koh uh, i'm not really sure but lactophenol blue is very effective or equally effective 
इन आइडेंटिफाइंग फॉर्म जाए The next question is that can patient with microbial keratitis continue to wear contact lenses? Can we recommend sterile lenses? Uh, we typically recommend the patients to be off the contact lens uh, during an active episode of microbial keratitis. And in fact, if a patient with a, a contact lens wearer presents with a with a corneal ulcer, it's also recommended to send the contact lens, the case, and the solution. for a microbiology because often the offending organism could be sourced from the contact lens or the solution as well uh, does honey avoid this fungus i am i'm not sure what this question is but uh, i'm i'm not sure about this question the next question is that are steroids contraindicated in the treatment uh, if we are dealing with fungus definitely steroids are contraindicated if we are dealing with bacterial keratitis the body of evidence points that usually there is no difference irrespective of whether we give steroids or not but there are clear cut guidelines when one should give corticosteroids in the setting of microbial keratitis these guidelines include that the organism should be identified the organism should be responsive to the drugs that we are giving the sensitivity profile of the organism has been identified and we are dealing with an organism that is affecting the central cornea and there is a chance that if we do not give steroids the underlying scarring will threaten the site and we are giving steroids when there is a graft infiltrate and the graft infiltrate is resolving to a bacterial microorganism and the bacterial microorganism once it has started resolving if we do not give steroids there is a chance that the graft will fail so when all these conditions are met then we should give steroids otherwise it's it's not really indicated or beneficial in the setting of microbial keratitis place of contact lens in enhancing corneal ulcers in microbial keratitis uh, i'm i'm not sure i understood the question would you mean that should we use contact lenses perhaps no uh, we should not use contact lenses uh, we should encourage the patient to discontinue contact lenses in the setting of microbial keratitis so atypical mycobacteria i believe atb intrastromal injections intrastromal injections have been tried in cases where, which are uh, not responding to topical treatment uh, especially uh, antifungal such as uh, voriconazole injections have been tried but uh, there have been studies that have found that there is ultimately no difference whether we use topical medications or intrastromal injections but it has been tried uh, oral antifungals the mut2 trial Uh, have definitively found that there is no uh, body of evidence which strongly supports the use of oral antifungals in filamentous fungal keratitis uh, but uh, it's not uncommon for many practitioners to use oral antifungals in deep mycosis or mycosis which involves the limbus or the adjacent sclera because the underlying uh, hypothesis is that Uh, when there is a oral intake of antifungals then they will be secreted better uh, and therefore will lead to increased therapeutic availability at the level of the sclera or perhaps uh, in the aqueous which is why in these settings some uh, some people certainly do prescribe it but uh, there is no definitive evidence can we use topical lenticide instead of steroids uh, certainly we can use that but we can also use uh, Uh, something like a immunomodulator such as cyclosporin which is actually used in the setting of one eyed patients or patients where there is a precious graft and we cannot give steroids because we are uh, considering that perhaps we are having a anti uh, we are having a fungal etiology here so it can be given uh, what is the role of cross linking in fungal keratitis this is a very good question i think all of us should deliberate something more about it cross linking has recently been uh, studied a lot uh, in the setting of intractable microbial keratitis and the evidence that has been generated is that usually it can work in end stage microbial keratitis which is completely refractory to all treatment 
Having said that, unfortunately, it does not work in the setting of fungal keratitis. Rather, it has detrimental effects or no effect when cross-linking has been done or not done. So studies such as the CLARE that have been recently published in ophthalmology have found that uh, cross-linking is not recommended in fungal keratitis. The major treatment for bacterial keratitis, it is completely based on the microbiology. So one has to start with an empirical broad spectrum treatment and that treatment should cover both anti uh, gram positive and gram negative organisms. But once that has been achieved, then one should switch over to a type of antibiotic against which a sensitivity profile has been mapped and specifically one should treat the patient for those, those antibiotics to which the organism is sensitive. Placental membrane, amniotic membrane, yes, it has been tried. Amniotic membrane has been tried. Uh, I do not use oral antifungals in, in fungal cases. I typically do not because the MOT2 trial uh, showed very conclusive evidence that there is no role of oral antifungals in fungal keratitis. But then as we discussed in certain deep mycosis, it can be used or when there is a fungal spheritis or spheral involvement, certainly one can use uh, oral antifungals. I'm not sure whether uh, the question is the best topical uh, steroid because it's usually the most potent one is prednisolone acetate 1% and dexamethasone. But one, if one is trying to use a low potency steroids, especially if there is a chance that the patient may be a steroid responder or might have a IOP shoot, then one can use a low potency steroids such as fluoromethalone or perhaps low tepredinol. Are there any alternatives? Uh, so the first question by Dr. Manthan, we have answered that, the oral antifungals. So that's uh, done. Is there any alternative for surgical therapy for fungal keratitis other than PK? Certainly we have a lot of alternatives. Uh, there are certain uh, experts who recommend to do a superficial keratectomy. Uh, lamellar keratoplasty or a deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty has also been published. And uh, one needs to be very sure that you have excised all the pathology or all the areas of infiltrate because unless one does that, there is a very high chance of recurrence. Is scraping of ulcer helpful? Uh, in case of fungal keratitis to enhance penetration, yes, uh, scraping or debridement of the ulcer is helpful to improve the penetration of the antifungal drugs. What is the best way of collecting material for culture in an impending perforation? It's better to do that in the setting of the operation theater because if the cornea perforates, then you should have a tissue adhesive in hand so that uh, one can apply the tissue adhesive over the area of perforation. What is the best topical antibacterial? Again, it depends upon the organism. Can we use a contact lens as a drug delivery system? Certainly this has been tried by different groups where contact lens, micro patches, micro needles have all been used as drug delivery systems. Which cultures do you suggest as an initial approach? Uh, we need to use all the plates. So if you do not have a lot of plates available, then at least a chocolate agar and a saburo dextrose agar should, should give us uh, some basic uh, media to work with. But certainly at least a chocolate agar should be there because the chocolate agar helps both the bacteria as well as the fungi to grow over it. If you suspect a non-infective PUK, should you start therapy with corticosteroid and antibiotics or should you do scraping? So certainly start uh, therapy with corticosteroids. However, uh, if you feel that there are infiltrates which are suspicious, there is no harm in taking a scraping before starting the treatment. If we cannot perform culture on clinical examination, 
Um, I'm not sure I understood the question. But if we can, I think the, the question is that if we do not have microbiology, then in the setting of uh, Southeast Asia and Africa, there is a scoring system that has been proposed, which can tell us what are the possible features of a fungal keratitis. So we can say that whether we are dealing with fungus or bacteria, but then if the patient has been treated elsewhere and the patient presents in an advanced stage of disease, it's, it's not really uh, clear what would work and then one can go wrong either way. So it's always best that one should scrape and go by the microbiology. For topical antifungal choices, natamycin and boriconazole. Yeah, natamycin and boriconazole, out of that, the MOT1 trial have definitively found that natamycin 5% is the better molecule. Now, having said that, fluconazole is typically reserved for candida keratitis. So for filamentous fungal keratitis, one has to prefer natamycin as that is the better molecule. Is there any role of topical betadine? Not really sure. It is a disinfectant, but uh, for a therapeutic uh, use, it will have a lot of irritation on the ocular surface. So the percentage of microbial keratitis where we get an organism or growth, again, in 30 to 40 percent, they are going to be uh, microbiologically negative. So there one has to uh, deal with either a micro, either a PCR or a biopsy, uh, or one has to just assess the treatment uh, to the res, uh, to assess the response to the treatment and then take a call. Bandage contact lens during treatment is required if a tissue adhesive is placed on the cornea because the tissue adhesive will irritate the uh, tarsal conjunctiva. So bandage contact lens certainly will be required. But otherwise, a routine bandage, bandage contact lens is not required. In fact, we should uh, avoid any contact lens wear so that there is better access of the drugs to the area of infiltrate. Can we combine maintenance dose of antivirals? The main, actually, it's a, it's a therapeutic dose of acyclovir 400 milligram five times a day adult dose for two to three weeks. And after that, the, the prophylactic dose consists of uh, 400 milligram twice daily for a period of three to six months after renal function tests are done to make sure that there is no underlying renal toxicity by the oral acyclovir. Can we combine fluconazole with topical antibiotic? It depends. It depends whether there is a combined infection or a super infection, one can certainly combine. Doxycycline certainly helps in reducing corneal melt and it can be given as an adjuvant treatment. That's correct. The gram slides, uh, we don't have any gram slide, but the KOH is usually confirmatory of pythium. And as I showed uh, in my previous slide deck, they are usually flat, ribbon-like with scanty aseptate or scantily septate filaments. They are usually much larger, more broader than the fungal filaments, which is how we make the, the we make the distinction between fungus and pythium. The growth also is very typical. It has flat, colorless colonies. But that's again not very definitive. What is definitive is demonstration of zoospores or by a PCR sequencing of the internal transcriber region. Frequency of topical antibiotics. Usually we start with a loading dose of hourly drugs for the first 24 hours, after which the patient is maintained for hourly uh, topical antibiotics for all hours uh, of waking. And after the first 48 hours have been over, with this we switch over to eight times a day and assess the response at one week. Is there a role of systemic antibiotics? Uh, no, there is no role of that. What are the treatment options in corneal melt? One should apply a tissue adhesive or a patch graft. 
or a penetrating keratoplasty depending on the area of melt and the tectonic support of the overlying cornea. What should guide a doctor on how many times the drug should be used? The response to treatment guides the frequency of installation of drops. Ocular toxicity is certainly suitable for MK once the features of toxicity subside. But what it means is that one needs to reduce the frequency of administration of the artificially instilled drugs because the drugs have preservatives and that is causing the toxicity. But if there is a role for uh, therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty or micro uh, or uh, optical PK once it has scarred, then certainly one can go ahead and do a PK. But one needs to be sure that one needs to balance the duration and the dosage and the frequency of the drugs. Can an optometrist treat microbial keratitis? Emergency treatment can be given, but it is best referred to an ophthalmologist for treatment of microbial keratitis. Iodine, again, we have discussed this question. It would not be very helpful. If we, if we do not have access to a lab service, then one needs to look for the scoring system that was discussed. Then that gives an idea of the positive predictive value of each of the signs, which includes the margins of the ulcer, raised slough, dry appearance of the slough, presence of hypopion, fibrin, or color of the infiltrates. So this will be true of predicting a fungal keratitis in a region where fungal keratitis is very common, such as Africa, Southeast Asia, or India, or South Florida. Emergency PK needs to be done in the setting of a ulcer that is worsening on maximal treatment, medical treatment, or if there is a corneal melt, there is a perforation, there is a extension to the corneal limbus or involvement of the adjacent sclera. In a progressive PUK, would not topical steroids increase the risk of perforation? Yes, it would. Therefore, we need to understand that this is an immune-mediated mechanism. Therefore, we need to balance the pro with the anti-inflammatory factors over here. And for tectonic support, usually a conjunctival resection with tissue adhesive is done prior to starting steroids. One should watch these cases because they can get superinfected with uh, bacteria or other organisms, in which case one has to stop the steroids do the microbiology and treat as per the etiology. Traditional treatments are usually not recommended. Therefore, I would certainly not recommend this line of treatment of applying any other, either honey or any traditional, because that's not found to be beneficial. On the contrary, it has led to worsening of such lesions. Usually, the first line of treatment for fungus is 5% natamycin, and for bacterial keratitis, one needs to start with a broad spectrum empirical uh, treatment, which include fortified uh, aminoglycosides or fortified cefazoline with uh, a fluoroquinolone, which is ciprotoxacin. Conductive resection is believed to be beneficial at least in two, two ways. Number one is that it uh, in the setting of a immune mediated peripheral ulcerative keratitis because it cuts off the blood supply and second the tissue adhesive add to the tectonic support but having said that there is a 37 to 46 percent chance of recurrence in the first to second year of uh, peripheral ulcerative keratitis immune mediated after conjunctival resection so yes it has benefit but then it's not totally foolproof either uh, I'm not sure about the question of plants fighting the fungus. The role of fortified drugs, uh, if you can achieve a fortified drug, if you can prepare it in your pharmacy, certainly, 
if not a broad spectrum fluoroquinolone can be used but broad spectrum fluoroquinolones also have a lot of underlying resistance therefore uh, a lot of organisms may not be responsive to that therefore a combination therapy of a fortified uh, cephalosporin or aminoglycoside with a ciprofloxacin usually is the best broad spectrum because it provides the maximum possible coverage against a range of gram positive and gram negative organisms okay sure thank you very much uh, all these experiences are from our personal experiences those of our mentors colleagues and, and fellows who have learned with us and the publications that one can find on pubmed so so certainly refer to all of that i have given the citation for almost all the material that i have used here and i would like to thank obis uh, and the managers for for this wonderful opportunity of reaching out to all of you it was a, uh, a fantastic and very interactive session and i will look forward to uh, coming back again with with more of our experiences and also take some more experiences from your end and share uh, thanks to all for joining in it was really wonderful interacting with all of you